Good evening, everyone. I'm Sue Racanelli, President of the League of Women Voters of Vermont, and on behalf of the League, St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Secretary of State Candidates Forum. Our purpose in hosting this forum is for you, the voter, to meet the candidates, to hear what they have to say on the issues, and to ask questions. The League of Women Voters is a volunteer, nonpartisan organization that neither supports or opposes any party or candidate. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. There are five candidates running to fill the role of Secretary of State, a position that is now open because Secretary Jim Condos is retiring. Four of them are here with us tonight. The Secretary of State serves as Vermont's Chief Elections Officer, a position that carries significant responsibilities. The new Secretary of State will play a vital role in administering and overseeing state elections, ensuring that elections for all levels of office are fair, and leading Vermont's efforts to protect our most fundamental of rights, the right to vote. In addition, the office manages many other aspects of state government, related to business, professional licensing, and public records. The person who fills this role is critically important. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom McCone, our moderator, to get us started. Tom is a former English teacher, principal, and library administrator. He lives in Montpelier and writes commentaries and feature articles for several publications. Tom will introduce you to the candidates, and we are so pleased that you have joined us this evening to learn more about them. Tom? Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Bob. It is a pleasure to be here in the St. John's Mary Athenaeum. This is such a beautiful building, and it's the, the home to the town library and to an absolutely marvelous art collection. This is uh, one of St. John's Mary's treasures and a treasure for the Northeast Kingdom as well. It's a great pleasure. It's a, a privilege for us to have a forum here tonight. In the library last year, actually, the Athenaeum, more it's bigger than just the library, but the Athenaeum last year had its 150th anniversary, which is, which is just wonderful. And tonight we're here for part of a process that is even older than the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum. We're here for a forum to encourage people to participate in our democracy. And tonight we have the candidates, four candidates for the Office of Secretary of State for the state of Vermont. The primary is August 9th. And uh, so this, is, this process is moving right along. So the candidates are each going to have two minutes to uh, provide an opening statement. And at the end, they'll have two minutes to provide a closing statement. Uh, in between, the biggest part of this is questions. The League of Women Voters has two questions. Uh, the candidates received one of them ahead of time, and then the second one they haven't seen. And then after that, we'll be asking questions from members of the audience here. And the, there, there are cards at the back table if you want to write a question down. Also, there's a, a League representative uh, circulating and handing out cards if you want to, want to uh, write something down. The cards will be collected, and the screener will go through them for purposes of making sure we don't have duplications. Um, and if there are duplications, we aren't, aren't going to use two that are the same, obviously. But they may combine a question um, so that you know, it makes sense to use one card and not, and not two. The, um, and we do have plenty of additional questions, so if the audience doesn't have enough, we have, we have plenty more. Talking and at the same time trying to judge how long you've been talking is quite a challenge. So we're very lucky because all four of these candidates are very skilled in this area. They, they can judge two minutes very precisely and, you know, and they will stop just before the two minutes is up. But just in case they're off their game tonight, um, we have a league volunteer in the front row who has cards that will not keep them uh, posted and how about how much time they have left. So um, candidates, of course, do not need to use 
the complete uh, two minutes. They're welcome to, but they don't have to. Some of the questions, I'm sure everybody will want two minutes. Other times, it might be something that's quicker. So the candidates have already drawn lots to see who was going first in the first round, and, and this will be for, the, for their opening statements. After that, we have a rotating schedule so that everybody takes turns going first, second, third, fourth, and also the order flips around so that we don't, you're not, the candidate isn't always going after the same other candidate each time. So I'll introduce the candidates, and then they, they will um, provide their opening statements. And I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be going for their opening statements, I guess. So first we have Representative Sarah Copeland, who's a Democrat. And then to her left, we have uh, uh, H. Brooke Page, who's a Republican. And on Sarah's right, we have uh, Deputy Secretary of State Chris Winters, who's a Democrat. And then the fourth candidate on the send here, we have Montpelier City Clerk John Odom, who is also a Democrat. So we'll get right on to opening statements. So Representative Copeland Hansis, you're first. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a cool gray night, so maybe uh, the temptation to stay home and mow the lawn or, or grill out was, uh, uh, was not so great. Um, but participating in democracy is always important, um, and I know that these are the folks who really understand that and believe that, uh, because you came out tonight to, to talk about the Secretary of State's race. Uh, I'm Sarah Copeland Hansis. I'm from Bradford. I am an 18-year veteran of the Vermont House of Representatives, uh, representing Bradford Fairley and West Fairley. Uh, representing rural Eastern Orange County um, is not, not a whole lot different than, uh, than this part of the country. Um, beautiful rolling hills, uh, some farm fields, and, uh, and some mixed industry. I'm running for Secretary of State because now more than ever, uh, our democracy is under threat from intentional misinformation to voter suppression to now elections deniers seeking to infiltrate Secretary of State's offices around the country. Uh, it is important that we uh, elect a Secretary of State uh, with a strong track record of leadership and who can navigate the complex environment that we have upcoming. Um, I have always stood for strengthening uh, elections and for uh, making it uh, easier for people to participate in their democracy. Um, as chair of the Government Operations Committee when COVID-19 hit, I led the path to, uh, to do our first ever universal vote by mail. Um, and because of the success and the great turnout that we had in 2020, um, I also led the effort to make universal vote by mail permanent for the general election going forward. I'm a proven leader, and I've never shied away from complex or complicated issues, and I would like to take my 18 years of experience in public service to the Secretary of State's office to defend democracy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Page. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women, Women Voters for sponsoring this uh, uh, fair, and especially the Anthonyum for hosting us here. The last time I was here, I was actually portraying Thaddeus Fairbanks with my whiskers on, so it's a little bit different role here I have today. I am Brooke Page from the town of Washington, the good Washington in Vermont, not that other one further south, and I'm hoping to be elected as Vermont's next uh, Secretary of State. Secretary of State's office is the least understood of the statewide offices here in Vermont. The office has a multifarious administrative function, uh, basically falling into three categories. Responsibility carried out by a staff of 80 with a budget of $17 million. The best known of these uh, functions is the ministerial duties of conducting the state's elections and compiling and curating the results. The secretary also oversees the Office of Professional Regulation, which registers, regulates, and investigates over 45 business classifications from a wide array of professions and trades. The secretary is the scribe for the state government, including the General Assembly. 
and is responsible for recording, publishing, and preserving the state's records and historic documents in the state archives. Additionally, past secretaries have gone beyond these principal duties and worked to develop uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Uh, develop and disseminate educational materials relating to the state's historic documents, civics, and governance. In recent years, each of these areas of responsibility have been neglected or intentionally changed in ways that have had a negative impact on the state and her citizenry. I hope that the forum will help you learn more about the Secretary of State's duties and responsibilities and will inform you as to the differences the candidates have on how those duties should be performed and improved. Thank you. Next we have City Clerk Odom. Hi everyone, thanks for coming and thanks to the Athenium, thanks to the League of Women Voters uh, for, for doing this. This is, this is terrific. I think uh, we've been doing a fair amount of these, so we're three of us here are getting pretty used to each other. Um, I think you'll find if you look back at the recent history of the Secretary of State's office, about every decade or so you get somebody from the outside, it was Jim Condos, before that it was Deb Markowitz, to come in with some fresh perspectives and ideas and really help move the office forward. And I'm here to make the pitch that, that I'm the next one for the job uh, for a few reasons. Uh, for one thing, I'm a 10-year city clerk. Um, so, I, and, you know, city clerks at the local level, we're handling the licensing, we're handling elections, we're handling archives, but we do it at the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor level. We look at our neighbors in the eyes and, and shake their hands. And I think that sort of grassroots approach could be a real benefit to the Secretary of State's office. And there's, uh, in the, before then, I've got a long history in, in, in activism, in uh, nonprofit work, in political work that has really informed my candidacy. There's a lot of things I hope we get to talk about today. I know there's a lot that we could talk about. I hope we get the chance to talk about election cybersecurity and how we can really create a whole new paradigm to take the, the whole idea to the next level and lead the country. I hope we talk about ways to help expand the franchise. I spearheaded non-citizen local voting in Montpelier, and uh, we had a successful election with it. Winooski's done it too, and I think the Secretary of State's office could support that kind of work and, and even encourage it. I hope we get the chance to talk about how the Office of Professional Regulation could be used as a conduit to promote Vermont values, anti-racism work, uh, uh, environmental work, that all could be used as professional development elements of uh, that we could, you know, work in the business community through OPR. And there's more, but I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Next, Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for sponsoring and putting this together. They were such a valuable partner uh, through 2020 in voter education and increasing voter access. Uh, the things that they did on Front Porch Forum to educate Vermonters about their options in voting during the pandemic were just uh, so helpful and uh, helped us have and achieve the greatest voter turnout we've ever had in the middle of a pandemic. So thank you to the League and thank you to the Athenaeum as well for hosting. Uh, my name is Chris Winters. I'm the current Deputy Secretary of State to Jim Condos. I've been Deputy Secretary for the last seven years. I've been in the Secretary of State's office for the last 25. And because I've done this work, I understand the challenges that we're facing right now and what's at risk. And I'm, and I'm saying tonight, and I have been saying, and these folks are probably tired of hearing me say it, but the challenges that we're facing today are really unlike anything that we've seen before. Election integrity is under attack. Voting rights are being restricted in ways we couldn't have imagined just a few years ago. Yet in Vermont, we've taken a different path. We've led the way in elections. We are ranked number one by MIT's election performance index for the last two presidential elections in a row. We lead the way in professional regulation. I'm asked to speak in other states on professional regulation. Um, and we also lead the way as far as the state, state agencies go and customer service and the, the, um, the valuable services that Vermonters rely on from our office every single day. 
I'm a problem solver who's done the work. I'm running because I'm interested in this job. I'm committed to this office. And I believe we need an, an effective leader with a proven track record who can hit the ground running. I'll be ready to lead on day one. Thank you. Thank you to all four candidates for staying within five minutes, five seconds, actually, five seconds of the uh, maximum two minutes. So I do want to mention before we move on that, as uh, Sue Racanelli mentioned, uh, there, there are five candidates on the ballot, and Progressive Robert Miller is also on the candidate in the, on the uh, ballot, and the league invited him uh, tonight, but he was unable to make it. Don't want you to think he was left out. So we're going to go on to the the first question. This is from the um, from the league and the candidates received this question in advance. I'll read the question now, and then if any of the candidates would like me to reread it during as we go along, I can do that. Of course. How would you prioritize the responsibilities of the Vermont, Vermont Secretary of State, given the current needs and concerns of Vermont residents? And this time, we start with Mr. Page. OK. Um, first of all, I didn't get the question for some reason ahead of time, but that's not a problem at all. I think that um, the Secretary of State's office has a, a sphere of responsibility. And I don't think that any one of those responsibilities is any lesser or greater than the others. I think that um, OPR may have gotten out a little over its skis. I, I believe that um, some of the professions and categories that they currently are responsible for overseeing are probably better set with the, uh, the Department of Health. Um, but beyond that, I, I think that um, the move towards um, Sorry, uh, paperless may have gone a little too quickly. I know of a lot of business individuals who were confused or befuddled and wound up not being able to uh, do what was expected of them. Uh, archives has its own set of problems. Um, I do a lot of research up to the archives in, in Middlesex, and many of the historic documents that are there are in tatters. Uh, and, and in desperate need of restoration. Other materials, research materials, um, have been contaminated with mold during their st uh, storage down at the, Re um, uh, the Redford building, Redstone building in Mount Pelier. Um, so each of these areas, and certainly elections, uh, uh, has its own set of issues and concerns, uh, especially since we've implemented uh, universal vote by mail and uh, vote har allowing vote harvesting and, and drop boxes and, and, and curing of votes. And so we'll talk about each of these later, but as far as uh, prioritizing, prioritizing one over the other, uh, it's not a juggling act where we're worried about one of the balls flying off into the, into the um, sunset there. Each, each of them is equally as important. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Clerk Odom, you're next. Well, uh, first of all, I think in general, I, I uh, agree with Mr. Page that there's a lot of functions to the office and prioritizing them is sort of a slippery slope. They're all very, very important. Having said that, we are in a crisis with our elections. There is an immediate war on the democratic process. So there's no, there is no ignoring that that's going on and that has to take an immediate priority simply because it's in crisis. I think in Vermont, we've, uh, you know, we've done very well. Chris and Jim have done a terrific job in, in so many ways. I spoke about cybersecurity. I do think it's time to reimagine the model completely. I am a certified ethical hacker. So I have a lot of experience with how these systems work and how they can be improved. And I would like to see us move to an open source system, which is a collaborative system, gets us away from some of these faceless corporations that we work with now. So that's one thing I'd like to do. I think another good way we can push back against the attack on democracy is by looking at, as I mentioned in my opening, creative ways to expand the franchise and supporting communities in doing that. And I don't just mean non-citizen voting, which we spearheaded, but Brattleboro is looking at 16 to 17 year olds voting. You know, things like this can be actively supported by the Secretary of State. And as far as, 
as words, when people accuse the election of being false or rigged or that there's, you know, it, that the, the election was somehow phony, I think the Secretary of State, it's no more complicated than standing up and telling the truth. Because we have the truth on our side, we tell the truth over and over and over. And eventually that truth is gonna get through. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. But. Okay, thank you. Um, and next we have Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you for the question, and because most people don't realize, and Mr. Page said it earlier, that the Secretary of State's office is a big and complicated agency for a somewhat small, relatively small agency in state government. There's elections, there's professional regulation with 50 professions and 80,000 licensees. There's the business registration aspect where we do 100,000 online transactions every single year. Every Vermont business has to come to our office as a first stop for registration. There's the State Archives and Records Administration where we have millions of, of, of uh, documents and some of our most precious documents in a vault. We have two forklifts in a warehouse and most people would realize that about the Secretary of State's office. Um, and last and certainly not least, there's overseeing elections, the most critical and fundamental piece of our democracy, the right to vote. And so that has to be our priority. Without free and fair elections, what do we really have as a democracy? I have been prioritizing those things my last seven years as Deputy Secretary of State, last 25 in the office. I can juggle all of those responsibilities. In fact, if you look at some of my social media, there's a video of me juggling and talking about these things. So we really do need to focus. We need to prioritize. COVID brought other things to the fore that we really had to focus on to make sure everybody had the right to vote and didn't have to choose between their health and their right to vote uh, through the pandemic. Uh, but we can do all of these things. That's why I argue that we need an experienced and effective manager. We don't need a politician. We need a problem solver in the Secretary of State's office, someone who's nonpartisan, someone who is focused on solving problems, on providing services, and not political. Okay, thank you. And next we have Representative Copeland Hansis. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things that I would do with the Secretary of State's office um, that I think are very important um, for strengthening um, democracy as well as for uh, strengthening our business communities and, uh, and assisting our Main Street businesses. Um, first thing that I would do is reinstate the education and outreach coordinator position that existed under Secretary Markowitz. Uh, this was a dedicated position who developed materials to help uh, educators and help engage young people uh, in how to participate in democracy. Uh, and, and while some educators may still be using some of those materials from a dozen years ago, um, many have not. And I would reinvigorate that, uh, that aspect of the Secretary of State's office. Because civics education is critical to us now. Being able to discern uh, truth from fiction is, uh, is a skill that our young people need to be learning. Uh, understanding how to vet candidates and how to uh, talk about the issues, uh, especially about issues that we disagree on without being disagreeable, um, is critical to the future of our democracy. And so that education and outreach coordinator would would be a critical role in helping Vermonters engage uh, in democracy going forward. A complement to that, though, uh, now that we do universal vote by mail for our general elections, is we should be producing a voter guide. When you get your ballot in the mail for the November general election, you should also get a voter guide that will help you uh, find the information that exists out there uh, from candidates up and down the ballot uh, so that you don't have to go searching for it. Because one of the really great things that we learned about uh, the way people enjoyed voting in uh, the COVID election year, our very first universal vote by mail, is they really enjoyed being able to take the time to sit down to research the candidates and I think the Secretary of State's office can make that easier for people. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the way that we can use the, the listing of uh, licensed professionals in a way that helps to uh, promote and market the services that these professionals offer, but I'm getting the stop card, so I'll get back to that later. 
Thank you. So for the uh, next question, which is also from the League, uh, the order of the candidates will be City Clerk Odom, Deputy Secretary Winters, Representative Copeland hands us, and Mr. Page. And that question is, and I will repeat the order as we go through so you didn't have to memorize that or anything. Um, given the misinformation around the country concerning election fraud, how would you assure Vermonters that our state elections are safe and fair? And we'll start with City Clerk Odom. Well, the misinformation uh, issue is is huge. It's hard to understand. Oh, well, it's huge. <laughs> it's something you'll hear folks at the Department of Homeland Security talk a lot about right up there with cybersecurity, if not more. It's been considered the number one threat to our democracy. Now, how can we can we help that situation in Vermont? There is. Elections have been declared by the federal government as critical infrastructure, and that means we get a lot of help, both at the Secretary of State's level and at the local level. And one service that they provide is to be a clearinghouse where all election administrators, secretaries of state, are reporting on misinformation that, they're, that is happening in their community or that they're observing nationwide. That information gets processed. We all get it sent back out. It's a terrific resource, but it's a resource that Vermont clerks are not using. Uh, I may be the only member of this particular clearinghouse, the EEI Isaac. Uh, so what this, and I don't think that's going to change because the EEI Isaac only serves local clerks so much. So what the Secretary of State's office can do is be a hub, is be the one that that all these local clerks would be reporting into when they see local information, coordinate that with that federal clearinghouse, and then take the information from the federal clearinghouse and process it, get it right back out to the local clerks. I think you can create a seamless interaction from the top to the bottom where all our information is shared on local, uh, we get shared all information from federal misinformation, it could be seamless. And uh, I think it's something that the Secretary of State's office is the only office that could serve that function. So I guess that's all I got. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you. I, I totally agree with John that uh, misinformation and disinformation are the greatest threat to our elections right now. When I started as Deputy Secretary of State seven years ago, it was cybersecurity. Uh, we were very focused on that, very concerned about that, and spent a lot of time and effort uh, beefing up our defenses to cyber attacks. Um, but I've seen a shift, and as John said, uh, elections are now critical infrastructure. The Department of Homeland Security is involved. Secretary Condos and I and our IT manager receive secret briefings about what sort of threats are coming our way from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there's foreign interference, there's domestic interference, there are real threats to election integrity. If, and so the greatest threat that we have right now is that the Americans have a shaken faith and, and they don't trust the election systems. And so how do we come back from that? How do we rebuild that faith? And I believe transparency is really the key to rebuilding trust, that we need to do things openly, that we need to help educate Vermonters on how our elections work, because if they ever did actually work the polls, talk to their town clerk, they would understand that some of these conspiracy theories are not humanly possible. They need to understand that when they talk about these threats and these conspiracies and this widespread fraud, they're talking about John Odom being part of a mass conspiracy. Not John, but not John individually, but <laughs> town clerks in general. <laughs> Civics is another big piece of this, and I, I really agree with what Sarah had to say about bringing back civics. Um, I served under Deb Markowitz. She did a lot around uh, uh, civics education. Deb is my uh, campaign treasurer. Uh, we do need to focus more on civics, get folks engaged at an early age, focus on civics, civil discourse, and media literacy as yet another way to defend democracy beyond just new laws and beyond cyber defenses. Uh, but education is a defense as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis. 
Well, I think the two gentlemen before me have talked a lot about um, some of the cybersecurity uh, focus, and uh, and I agree with that, and uh, and obviously will uh, continue to focus and prioritize that. I think it's really important, though, for Vermonters to understand that our elections are secure in part because we have nearly 250 local elections administrators for a population that's the size of the city of Boston. And those people are on the front lines of uh, administering our elections uh, during the run-up to Election Day, processing uh, the ballots that are coming in from absentee or from our universal vote by mail in the general election. And these are the people who are doing the, the majority of that work in helping to make sure that we have fair, accessible, and safe elections. Um, and so I would really look to them. And, and, uh, and as I've been campaigning, uh, I've been going around and talking to a lot of town clerks, asking them what they see, what they need, what can we do more of, uh, how can we support you in doing your job. And so I would really look to uh, that collaborative relationship between the local elections administrators and the elections division, division at the Secretary of State's office to help ensure that we continue to have the most uh, safe, fair, and accessible elections. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Page? Very next. good. I need a half an hour, but I, don't, I only have two minutes. <laughs> Can you rearrange the cards for me? Uh, <laughs> Election integrity uh, is really a, a, an issue of confidence of the voters. And I, I think all of the misinformation and disinformation and things that are out there, to, to get all in a lather over this is to ignore the fact that the voters in this state, the citizens of the state, are intelligent people. And they should be relied upon to a degree to have the good sense to figure out what's right and wrong. I'm going to take the rest of this time to talk about what my biggest concern is with the current election process. And that's that we've completely shaken up the basket here as far as we run elections. All of a sudden, the uh, universal vote by mail that we were told would only be because of the pandemic and we'd go back to our normal course after that uh, has been uprooted. Uh, suddenly, we have universal vote by mail once again. And in the other states where this has been done, you've all, they always have voter ID or a combination of up-to-date date voter checklists and signature examples so that the mail-in ballots can be properly uh, authenticated. Uh, beyond that, we suddenly have unregulated vote harvesting where the law basically says anybody can show up with a number of ballots and uh, the law says only 25. But we have no registration of the vote harvesters. So we have no idea whether John Smith, the vote harvester, who's probably being paid by some organization to go out and do this work. And, and in many states, the harvesters are also paid a bounty for collecting these ballots. And so John, the vote harvester, can go to town A and drop off 25, and go to town B and drop off 25, and no one's going to be the wiser. More nefarious than that, the vote harvester also has the opportunity to pick up ballots and in the course of converse, having conversation with the voter, determine how that person's voting. And if they're of a specific political bent, maybe some of those votes that uh, are contrary to how uh, their, their particular political incl inclination is, maybe those ballots don't make it to the uh, election, to the uh, ballot box, and nobody's going to be the wiser. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit later about uh, the ballot drop boxes and also about ballot curing, but I've run my course here for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to be moving on to questions from members of the audience. A reminder that if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand and a person from the league will bring you a card or you can go to the table in the back and write a question on a card there. So we have uh, at least a half a dozen questions so far. So uh, this is the first one, and in the order for this one will be Deputy Secretary Winters, uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, Mr. Page, and City Clerk Odom. And the question is, I would like to know how your experience is different from the other candidates 
and why it makes you the best qualified to be our next Secretary of State. So, Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you, I really like this question. <laughs> Um, I've done the job. I've, I've been there for 25 years. That doesn't entitle me to this position just because I've been there, but I have a proven track record to go along with it. I've been the deputy secretary for the last seven, which means I oversee the entire office. Secretary Kondo sets the vision for the office. I carry it out on the ground. We've been a partner in making decisions for the last seven years. And I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, the voters that I'm talking to as I'm campaigning around Vermont are very happy with the services that the Secretary of State's office provides. We have a really great leadership team. I've been a part of selecting that leadership team. I have the relationships, I have the experience, I've done the work. I lead the legislative agenda across the street. I'm in charge of HR, I'm in charge of IT, I'm our records officer. I've gone with Secretary Condos around the state on the transparency tour, talking about open meetings and public records. I am an attorney, but don't hold that against me. Um, I've also um, started our communications plan in the office and lead our communications, started our social media so that we can reach out to Vermonters where they are. My broad experience, makes me ready to lead this office on day one. I think Vermonters want stability and continuity in the Secretary of State's office at a time when everything seems in flux. I want Vermonters not to have to worry about this position. Um, I am passionate about this work, I'm committed to this work, and I hope that I can be the next Secretary of State. Thank you. Next, Representative Copeland Hansis. Thank you so much. Um, so my experiences are uh, a bit broader and uh, perhaps a bit more varied. Um, I have been a small business owner for 11 years where I had the challenge of uh, not only meeting payroll and, uh, and, and juggling the expenses of the business, uh, but also uh, hiring, managing, supervising um, employees for 11 years. Um, that is, uh, that is a, an experience that I treasure because I think it gave me a really good sense of what it's like to own and operate a business. Um, in addition to that, I have been uh, a legislator for 18 years, which means that I have been uh, experienced in uh, doing customer service, uh, constituent service in a way that uh, nobody else at this table ha uh, has done. 18 years of knocking on doors and talking with people about what they're concerned about, uh, talking with people about what ideas they have, uh, what new things they'd like to see implemented, and then taking those ideas to Montpelier and implementing them uh, is, a, is an important skill set and an important uh, track record. Uh, most importantly, though, I have been chair of the Government Operations Committee that oversees all of the aspects of the Secretary of State's office. And so when the Secretary of State comes to the legislature with uh, changes that need to be made in OPR or ideas on how to in improve people's access to democracy, those changes needed to be moved through my committee and with my leadership through uh, the entire House of Representatives. And so that gave me the experience to understand the political challenges and the uh, and the energy that is trying to undermine some of the important reforms that we're working on. And I think that that is a critical distinction in this election. Thank you. Mr. Page? Yes. Um, I've wor worked in the private sector most of my life uh, for Fortune 100 companies, Sterling Drugs, and uh, for Fortune 500 co companies, Interstate United and also Hammer Mill Paper Company. Um, after all of those companies were liquidated uh, in hostile takeovers, and I wound up with three golden parachutes in a row, I figured I was tired of trying to climb somebody else's uh, corporate ladder and went in business for myself. And for the next 20 some odd years, I ran a million and a half dollar retail business in the city of Philadelphia while commuting back and forth to Vermont every weekend. I ran newsstands and coffee shops in the subway system. And if you don't think that's guerrilla retail, you have no idea. But we had a staff of 47. We did, like I said, about a million and a half in 
sales plus lottery sales. And so I certainly was uh, well acquainted with managing people and managing various locations and different functions. Since I retired, to forced retired to Vermont, I almost died from congestive heart failure. And, um, I've been busily getting involved in politics. Uh, Marty Seawright talked me into running for US uh, Senate back in 2012, I guess it was, when they didn't have anybody else to run, at least till the last minute. And since then, I've, I, I got a feeling for elections and the troubles that we have here in Vermont, and most importantly, the fact that our open primary system allows for all sorts of nefarious goings on, and, and especially the Democratic Party trying to sabotage the uh, the Republicans' ability to field a full slate of candidates in the general election. Um, beyond that, most recently, all of this going on with the universal vote by mail, I think, has uh, acted to uh, destabilize or, or create consternation amongst the, the voters that didn't exist previously. I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. And City Clerk Odom. Well, I think the, my first answer, something that makes me uniquely qualified, would be, again, the, I think, unique clerk's experience of, of working on these sorts of, of, of uh, tasks in a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor level. Um, it's very personal. And the reason I'm hesitating a little is that I got struck by it again a moment ago, listening to the litany of conspiracies about uh, how elections are run, both by people like me and how they are engaged in by people like my constituents. Uh, I thought I was done getting upset about that, but I guess it's about the context here. Um, it's very personal to me. I know election administrators in other parts of the country who've been run out of their jobs. So I think I'm in a unique position to talk about that, but that personal, that personal level of this kind of work, I think, would also make me uniquely uh, qualified to take some conversations around the state. For example, I want to talk about ranked choice voting. That's something that's been uh, talked about a lot in Burlington. They had it, then they didn't, now they have it again. And it's, it's just been a sort of distant idea around the state. The election administrator in me has always been concerned about that, but I, I think it's the right thing to do, and I, Secretary of State, would like to bring this conversation to the personal neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor level. Uh, I would like to bring in folks from Maine where it's done. I'd like to bring advocates, voters, clerks together and go on a tour, see if we can build some consensus on this, because there's a lot to talk about there. Um, so that's primarily it. I could talk about my credentials in cybersecurity, which I do think is moving back to being the number one issue ever since the war in Ukraine began. I think it's, I think it's going to be coming stronger than ever. Um, you know, I am a certified ethical hacker. I am on the advisory board of the Cyber Policy Institute of the University of Chicago, and I am out of time. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, coming up to the second question from the audience, and the order of next time, this next time will be Deputy Secretary Winters, City Clerk Odom, Mr. Page, and Representative Copeland hands us. And this question uh, is about mail-in voting. It has been mentioned a few times in your opening statements or uh, in other questions have answered, but this, uh, this gives everybody a chance to address this question. Do you support mailing out live ballots to all names on the Secretary of State list in general elections? You okay. said I, you said yes, I was Deputy going, Secretary Winters. I, I just want to point out that I did go first on the last round. I don't want to. I know you did. Okay. I get to go first again? But every, You are first again, but then sure. you're not going to be first again for quite a while. All right. <laughs> but it's going in the opposite order now. Just checking. So just people checking. who you were following are now following you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Tom. I do support mailing ballots to every registered voter, every active registered voter. There is a distinction there. We don't mail ballots to challenged voters. Um, I think the experience that we had in 2020 with record turnout and Vermont voters saying, hey, I like this 
universal male thing. I like to sit at my dinner table um, and be able to look up candidates online um, and talk to my family about it if I want to. I got to vote next to my daughter uh, when she voted for the first time. Um, and Vermonters have really embraced vote by mail, and that's why we came back the next year and said, hey, let's make this a permanent thing for the general election. It increases turnout. Uh, not everyone can easily get to a polling place. Not everyone is comfortable in a polling place. Uh, so giving Vermonters options was a very good thing. You can vote by mail, you can vote early, you can use a ballot drop box, or you can still go in and vote in person. And I, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the implication there is with the, the word live ballots, but I think it's, again, this concern that maybe there's some voter fraud out there. Um, we do have security measures in place, and I'll say that our voter checklist gets better every single day. We're bouncing it off other states. We're checking it against death records. Uh, we have the DMV, so that if anyone makes a change at the DMV, that voter checklist is updated. We have our clerks and BCAs looking at these voter checklists every single year. Um, our voter checklist is stronger today than it ever has been, and it needs to be with the increased use of mail ballots. I am very strongly in support of vote by mail and proud of the work that we've led in increasing access to the ballot box by the use of vote by mail. Thank you. Next, City Clerk Odom. I love the term live ballots. I'm sitting here thinking about it. You know, what do I think of that? But <laughs> it sort of implies the sort of living, breathing quality to the whole process and the whole democracy. So sign me up for, for uh, team live ballots. Um, so the answer to the question, uh, yes. Yes, 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 absolutely. I am all in favor of, of the mail-in uh, ballots. In fact, I think it should be expanded. Uh, my own uh, uh, city council wanted to do it for our, our town meeting day election, but there are some disincentives still existing in the current law that create problems if you're, say, with a school and a shared a union district. So I'd like to see that, that ironed out a little bit to re-incentivize that. I think it should be included with the primary. Uh, election. Now, uh, with the primary one, you're going to have to simplify the process a little, and I do think we need to look at simplifying the process. I get more concern about, you know, ballots that aren't done right or need to be um, need to be disqualified in the uh, in you know in the the primary election, obviously because it's more complicated. Um, I think that could probably leave it at that. There were a few other things I was going to say, but I lost them, so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Page. Yes. Um, in 2019, Vermont was judged as being one of the five states that had the most accessible election process. The other four, if memory serves me correctly, were Maine, Illinois, Washington and Oregon states, and I think Oregon and Washington already had universal vote by mail. Um, and it needs to be remembered that we were already considered the most accessible with our early and absentee voting program that confined the ballots that were out wandering around, if you like, to those who had requested them in advance from their town clerk and received them and returned them. Well, there was a great checks and balances here. The person contacting the town clerk, the town clerk knew that person was on the checklist, mailed the ballots out to them. They were anticipating getting them, and once they got them and mailed them back, the clerk was anticipating their return. That's far different from where we're you know, uh, peppering the countryside with all sorts of ballots, and, and we don't have really up-to-date voter checklists. Uh, I don't think we're gonna put this genie back in the b bottle, unfortunately, but I think until we have a far higher degree of confidence in what we're doing, all of the ballots that go out using universal vote by mail should be sent out by certified mail so that we have a high degree of confidence that the people that they're intended to be received by are received. 
and this would also prevent the postal officials from dumping piles of the ballots in the, at, the, uh, at the doors of apartment buildings and, and dormitories. Um, there was one example that showed that there was a problem with universal vote by mail in the previous election where I think it was either True North or um, the Ethan Allen Institute went to Middlebury and found that in one small sampling, there were 10 ballots that were returned from folks that no longer were qualified to vote. I have to end here. Okay, thank you. And Representative Copeland, hands us. I appreciate the question, and I think it goes without saying that I do support universal vote by mail because I led the process um, not only during the 2020 uh, emergency vote by mail provisions, uh, but again, when we came back uh, to make it permanent. Uh, going forward. Um, reporting that bill on the floor of the House was a proud moment for me and, uh, and I will stand proudly uh, with my contention that making it easier for people to vote is important if you believe in a democracy. If you believe in a democracy, you also value somebody being able to be an informed voter and spending five minutes in, uh, in a booth on election day with your ballot is not always the easiest way to feel like you are an informed voter. Over my nine terms running for my house um, seat, I went door knocking and I would often talk to people who would say uh, occasionally, I just don't know how to vote. Like I don't know how to, how to even I don't know any of these people. How, how am I supposed to go in and, and execute my ballot when I don't know these people? And that's why I'm so committed to the idea that uh, the education and outreach so people know how to vote and the voter guide so that people know who's on their ballot are gonna be critical going forward and, and excellent tools in engaging and, and strengthening our democracy going forward. I've also spent a lot of time standing outside on election day. That's one of the things that I always wanted to do because I figured even if it's cold and miserable in November, I want voters to see me there working hard um, and being accessible to them if they have a last minute question. And inevitably, there would be people who would, would come screaming in at the end of the day just before the polls close because in many of our communities, people work far away from where they live. And in order to be able to get back to vote by seven o'clock on election day, it's really hard for some people. And so I support mail-in voting because I think it's a critical way for people to be able to vote uh, at their kitchen table on their own time and to do so uh, with much more information. Okay, thank you. So for the next question from the audience, uh, the order will be City Clerk Odom, Mr. Page, Representative Copeland Hansis, and Deputy Secretary Winters, who's not going to be going first for quite a while again. <laughs> Just by the way it falls. Ever again. <laughs> Depends on how, we, how many more questions we get to. Uh, this question mentions a, a couple of topics. However, it has a heading at the, topic, at the top, licensing. So I think that's the, the part of this question that is the central part. Uh, Vermont is a leader in the nation in licensing including sunrise pr um, procedures, as well as election procedures and policies. How will your administration continue this, and how do you think this can be improved? Well, first of all, I think Chris and company have done a great job with it. Uh, in terms of the structure they've set up, it, it is terrific. I wouldn't touch it. Uh, what I would do is expand the, the whole idea of what we can do with it. I think here you've got this just extraordinary system where the Secretary of State's office is a hub of a wheel with so many spokes going out to, to you know, licensed professionals, out to businesses, and that is a tool that is sitting there that could be used in other ways. And I'm thinking of ways um, to you know, really promote and encourage Vermont values and in, in, in stronger communities particularly through things like, you know, let me give an example here. I think uh, there's opportunities through that network to expand professional development, but also imagine professional development, uh, say, on regarding anti-racism work in the workplace. You know, you could encourage, notify folks in that network 
about professional development opportunities, possibly trainings along those lines, and then the folks who participate, the Secretary of State can, can praise them for it, can put them on their website, can even put them out in a you know, press release and saying, look, these are the businesses that have, have you know, taken this seriously and done this work and aren't we proud of them. You could also, I could also imagine using the system to push out the Equal Pay Compact. Right now, the Equal Pay Compact, I, I believe, has a couple hundred, maybe more than that, signatories. If you put that out onto this network, you could quadruple that in absolutely no time. And that's just the kind of resource that, the, that OPR is that we could be taking advantage of in a positive way to positively reinforce some of these values. Thank you. Mr. Page? Yeah, I think the one thing we don't need is for OPR to become more expansive than it already is. I think that... Um, that it's taken off more than it, it, it can chew or more than it should be able to digest. Uh, I know when they went paperless, they did so far too quickly and many businesses who were uninformed or confused fell out of compliance and uh, merely emailing communications uh, about being out of compliance wasn't helpful in helping them uh, get back in, in line. Registration and, and regulation of professionals is part of the responsibility, and while regulation functions should remain under the purview of the office, uh, investigation and re review and en enforcement of medical professionals especially would be better served by being under the uh, Board of Medical Practices. Additionally, registration of notary publics should be returned to the judicial branch from which it was taken, uh, where the county uh, superior court clerks were oversaw the administration until 2018. OPR needs to coordinate with and defer to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development uh, for uh, promotion of Vermont businesses, as well as workforce development and the Department of Labor for labor-related issues. Uh, I, I keep hearing, not overly today, but in the past, where people are looking for this expansive view of the Secretary of State's office, which is really encroaching upon other departments within the government that are more rightly assigned those responsibilities. I hope that answers the question completely. Thank you. Representative Copeland Hansis. Um, thank you for the question, and um, while one of you knows what the Sunrise process is, I'm suspecting that there are probably some other folks out there who don't, um, and I think it's important to touch on that for a moment because the goal of professional licensure really should be uh, solely focused on the uh, public health and public safety. Um, and so this Sunrise um, process is put in place because when you have the suggestion that we should license a different occupation or profession, the Office of Professional Regulation will do an analysis about whether there are legitimate um, uh, public health or safety concerns that uh, would be better met by having a registration or a licensing process. And I think that that's a really important and really fair way uh, to, to, uh, to keep regulation right-sized, to make sure that regulation isn't being used as a protectionist uh, tool to try to block people from being able to do a certain profession. Um, and I guess what I want to say um, uh, over and above um, that little uh, lesson is that I think that there's a lot that OPR can do to, uh, to help strengthen the, the businesses uh, who, who um, have licensed professions within them. And uh, some of the important ways that, that I will do that is by listening to those licensed professionals, uh, finding out what they think. I've been doing that as I've been on the campaign trail, and what I'm hearing from folks is that they really like the email reminder that they get to renew their license. It's actually really convenient. Good job. <laughs> There's a link. Uh, they can go on uh, to the website. They can renew their license simply and easily. Um, but there are more things that we can learn from the licensed professionals about how the Secretary of State's office could make, uh, make it easier for them to do their job. And I'm 
getting the stock card. So I will come back to that on the next round. Thank you. And Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you. OPR was where I, I, I cut my teeth as a public servant many years ago. Um, I worked as a staff attorney. I worked as counsel to the licensing boards, the nursing board, the pharmacy board, the dental board. Um, I served as a hearing officer when complaints came before those boards, and so I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about this tonight. It's a, a small, unknown division that serves a really important function in state government. OPR, the Office of Professional Regulation, receives some 800 to 1,000 complaints every single year about licensed professionals, those 50 professions and those 80,000 licensees. Uh, we have an, a whole enforcement and adjudication division. We have several law enforcement officers who do these investigations and multiple prosecutors who prosecute them, uh, an adjudic adjudication system so that people get a fair hearing and most importantly, the public is protected. It's all about public protection. Um, you know, that dentist who may have a, a substance abuse problem, that LNA who may be stealing from one of their elder patients. Um, there are very serious health and safety public protection issues in the Office of Professional Regulation. I think we've done a very good job uh, there, and I mentioned earlier, um, we are considered a model for other states. I've been to several states to talk about how we do it in Vermont, where, and the, the term right-sized was used, that's exactly right. You go just far enough to protect the public, but not so far as to interfere with entry to the profession or to interfere with the marketplace. Uh, so OPR can continue to do that work. We can build on it. OPR is now also a workforce development tool, so when it comes to things like healthcare professionals, we can make it more attractive to come here when our regulations are right-sized, when we're cutting edge, when we accept education from other states in a reciprocal fashion. We can actually build the workforce through the Office of Professional Regulation. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the next question, the lot will be Mr. Page, Representative Copeland Hansis. Deputy Secretary Winters and City Clerk Odom. This question is, uh, serves as a follow-up to the previous one. This is also about licensing, um, Office of Professional Regulation, and specifically about uh, Senate Bill 226 and building science education. As you know, a contractor registration uh, provision was included in the big housing bill, S226. This requires pres uh, residential builders to register with OPR, that's Office of Professional Regulation, and allows them to acquire and list optional specific certifications. How would you use this provision to improve awareness and knowledge of building science, that is, energy dynamics, airflow, moisture, et cetera, in the construction industry? Okay, Mr. Page? Yeah, um, okay. You know, uh, once again, I just, uh, this expansive view of the Secretary of State's office and OPR is just mind boggling to me. That, uh, you know, it strikes me that uh, the Department of Commerce or uh, is more suited towards uh, uh, supervising and, and, and promoting the building trades and, and, and things in, in the state. Uh, the uh, energy department in the state as far as uh, uh, regulating insulation and upgrading of buildings and things like that. It just, it just strikes me as a wrong fit for OPR and for the Secretary of State's office. Uh, since I have lots of time left, I'm going to sneak back in and, and uh, talk a little bit more about um, OPR and, and about archives. Um, I'll take a minute for archives. Um, the, the public, uh, there's been a discussion elsewhere about the public records ombudsman being part of the um, uh, archives and making it more accessible for individuals uh, to be able to get at the, the public records, uh, especially since um, the archives took over the State Library, which was a wonderful resource for folks and has been dissembled and most of the materials are now behind locked doors that previously were available openly uh, to peruse. Uh, some of that material also wound up behind locked doors with the uh, library division 
at the uh, Spalding Building of the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, many of the records in archives, as I mentioned before, are in terrible shape. Uh, the charter from my town of Washington, signed by Thomas Chittenden, is in a, a, a formerly book that is now disintegrated, and uh, the individual pages are still trustworthy, but the overall book is just kept in a box. And uh, like I said, there's other problems with molds and things like that at archives that need to be resolved and haven't been. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis. Thank you so much. Um, so the contractor registry is something that I worked on uh, for quite some time uh, over the course of the last few years. And uh, the reason I supported passage of this is because uh, for most Vermonters, your home is your most valuable asset. And the people that come in to help you repair your home or put on an addition or uh, re-roof your home need to be uh, people who are reliable. Because if you put down a $10,000 deposit for, uh, for the, the addition you needed to put on for your growing family and your contractor ghosts you, that is a tremendous hit to anybody's uh, family budget. And the, the Attorney General's office supported the contractor registry uh, because of the consumer fraud concerns about it. Uh, but the question was really more, uh, more gauged towards something that's a little bit more exciting and a little bit more in my bailiwick, which is around home energy and around saving Vermonters money uh, in how they heat their homes and increasingly how you cool your home in the summertime. Um, and so the ability to have this contractor registry gives us a tool in which we can uh, display contractors' special certifications that they have in building science, in, um, in, in safely insulating and ventilating, in uh, installing renewable energy uh, heating systems. Um, all of these are important tools that Vermonters want to have at their disposal when they decide who they're going to contract with to do a, a, a job in their home. And I think it's an exciting opportunity, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud to have worked on that bill. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you. We worked on the, the regulation of home improvement contractors with the Attorney General's office over multiple years to get a bill that was um, acceptable and, and right-sized, I think, for, for all parties to get it passed because the governor uh, did veto it at least once um, and had some objections to it. And I just want to refocus that, the, that this, the Office of Professional Regulation is about public protection. So we were trying to address home improvement fraud and in particular, small dollar contracts that would come, um, people would show up, they would uh, promise something, they would take a deposit, and then they would never come back, particularly for, for older Vermonters where we were seeing it most. Um, and the Attorney General's office really wanted to do something about that, and they looked to the Office of Professional Regulation, we brought it to the legislature, we worked hard on the Senate side, we worked hard on the House side, and eventually it ended up in a housing bill. Um, and the, the contract, the, the regulation itself is extremely light touch. So we talk about right size regulation only going far enough to protect the public. It requires three things. You register with the Secretary of State's office. You have a written contract. A lot of these folks were ripped off because they didn't have a contract. And the contractor has to carry insurance. Three very simple things. And surprisingly, we've got a lot of resistance to that uh, over, I think it took over four years to pass this bill. Um, but it's all about public protection. Uh, and in addition to that, we can be a conduit for information to help enact certain policies, uh, green energy building certifications were built into that bill. You know, in other professions like forestry, we can help with uh, good forest management um, in other professions that we regulate. But first and foremost, we should be focused on public protection and addressing complaints I do disagree a little bit with my colleagues at the table here. I don't think OPR should be activist. I don't think OPR should engage in marketing. I do think it needs to stay focused on public protection. Thank you. And City Clerk Odom. Sure, well, I'm supportive of the bill, and I very much appreciate what Chris is saying about a light touch. And I know what a light touch is is very much gonna depend on, on where you fall on the political spectrum, and I'm a, 
I'm, I'm with these guys here, so as far as that goes. Um, <laughs> uh, as far as the, the information it makes available um, and the way it promotes, you know, the opportunity there to really promote green building and, and such, it's a great model. It's great. It was, it's something that's very, very appropriate to license. Um, I don't know in terms of, if I read the question correctly, heard the question correctly, um, you know, the idea of getting some of this information about these contractors out there. I don't know that Secretary of State is in a great position to sort of stand up and, and, and scream that information from the rooftops, but they are in a good position to do that in some partnerships, you know, green building organizations and, and such would be interested in, in helping the, that kind of word out as far as, yeah, to the extent that I understood the question to be, how can this be a, a, a tool for education? I think the key in that is going to be partnerships with other interested uh, bodies and nonprofits. Um, say that'd be a tough one to just scream from the rooftops ourselves. But. Thank you. Um, after this next uh, question from the audience, we'll be moving to the closing statements. And uh, this one from the audience is actually a follow-up also to a topic that has come up a few times. Um, and they do, the questioner asks a, for a specific part of this issue. It's about ranked choice voting. And uh, the, the, the order here will be Representative Copeland Hansis, uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, City Clerk Odom, and Mr. Page. And the question is, please share your thoughts about ranked choice voting. Specifically, what have you learned about the Vermont Constitution to help you decide how to advise the legislature if they have a bill proposed? So Representative Copeland hands us. Thank you for that question. Um, so I support ranked choice voting. Um, and I support it for a number of reasons um, because, uh, because I think that it gives people the opportunity to, uh, to um, have possibly their second choice candidate um, uh, assume office instead of, uh, instead of you know, their first choice candidate maybe losing the majority of, uh, of the vote. Um, I don't have concerns about the constitutionality of ranked choice voting. The legislature uh, is the, the sole um, keeper of, um, of how we do elections in Vermont and, uh, and has within its rights uh, to establish uh, any method or criterion for voting. Um, I think Vermonters, however, need a little bit of time to understand how it works. And, um, and that's why organizations like the League of Women Voters are so important in Vermont, because uh, we know we can rely uh, on the League of Women Voters to, to get out and really be a partner in how to participate in democracy. So I think it's wonderful that Burlington has enacted ranked choice voting for their um, uh, for their city council seats, and I think it'll be a, a wonderful opportunity for Vermonters to watch and see how that works. And I would also advocate as your next Secretary of State for us to institute ranked choice voting for the presidential primary in 2024, because that's a perfect election uh, in which to give Vermonters the uh, experience of using ranked choice voting, because there are always multiple um, uh, candidates on the ballot for your presidential primary. Uh, and it'll be an important time for Vermonters to learn how ranked choice voting works. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Winters. Well, you're not going to hear much different from me than what Representative Copeland Hans has just said. I'm also in favor of, of ranked choice voting. I don't have concerns with the constitutionality. I've listened into the same uh, presentations I think she has had from legislative council about this. Um, and I will say we should proceed with ranked choice voting, but do it on a test basis. We're number one ranked in elections in the country for a reason. It's because we're careful, we're thoughtful, we bring all parties on board. We've had tripartisan support for things like automatic voter registration, same-day registration, ballot curing, vote by mail. 
We build a lot of support. We are careful in, in the way that we do it so that Vermonters can fully embrace and trust these policies. So we need to do the same for ranked choice voting. Um, I, the reasons that I am in favor of it, you know, it ensures majority winners. Um, it, it decreases partisanship because candidates are also um, angling for those second place votes as well. And you don't have to vote strategically, you can vote your conscience. And I don't know about you all, but I've been very tired in the, in the last uh, several pres presidential elections, in fact, of uh, voting strategically rather than voting my top choice. Um, I think our next step, as uh, uh, the representative said, is to try this out in a presidential primary in 2024, and we should start that discussion in early 2023 to make that happen. Thank you. City Clerk Odom. Oh, can I just say what they said? <laughs> 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 so what, what I learned from the Constitution, I'll take that, that question head on. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with the, the Constitution, state Constitution and voting lately when we did work on uh, non-citizen voting or all resident voting, as they say in Winooski, probably more fairly. So. Um, Looking at uh, how voting is, is discussed and, and what the, the constitutional parameters are, what I learned from looking at the Constitution is that it's fine, all right? Now, moving on from that, uh, I do want to reflect what, uh, what the last two folks said, what Chris and Sarah said about uh, confidence. If we're gonna move forward with ranked choice voting, uh, there's gotta be a confidence degree. And, and you know, that's not just with voters, it's with election administrators. I've been of two minds on this in the past. Uh, you know, the election administrator in me was kind of terrified. I'm trying to imagine doing a recount with ranked choice voting, right? Um, but then morally, out of principle, it just seems like the right thing to do. It seems like the practical thing to do because it does create a better picture of the will of the electorate. And absolutely, it can help bring down some of that uh, you know, nastiness that you see in elections because you don't want to alienate the, uh, the second place or the, you know, your, your second choice voters there. Uh, but to build that confidence, this is what I was talking about earlier. I think this needs to be a roadshow from the Secretary of State. I need, think we need to bring people together and start working on that consensus, community by community. Not unlike the, the transparency tour that uh, Chris and Jim have done, I think we need to go on a ranked choice voting tour and try to develop that. At the very least, we can start moving that conversation out of just Burlington. It's uh, time to call that question, and I would love to do that. Thank you. And Mr. Page. Well, I guess I'm going to go off in a different direction here because I do not support ranked choice voting. I know after they had, I guess it was a congressional election in Maine several years ago, many of the, or most of the voters that were involved were left scratching their heads wondering how the the uh, highest vote getter wound up not being the elected official. Um, understand clearly that ranked choice voting is an alternative to having a runoff election amongst the top vote getters, something that's much less confusing and much clearer that uh, if you have a field of five candidates for one office and the law says that one of them must get a majority of all the votes then if none of the candidates achieve that um, status, then you would have a runoff election amongst the top two or possibly three vote getters. Um, you know, all, uh, I mean, the whole thing with ranked choice voting, it's, it's like some hocus pocus, put your ballot into some black box and uh, let's see what comes out. And it, it's, it's just very troubling and it's something I certainly don't support. Thank you. So in just a moment, we'll start uh, uh, closing statements by the four candidates. Uh, I do want to mention for you that we do have an audience uh, question that you may want to address in your closing statement. It's up to you, but it's pertinent. What are the two key issues and or concerns you see facing the Secretary of State's office in the next year? Okay. So it's up to you, but that's a question that we aren't officially getting to as we move on to the closing statements. Um, 
next in the sequence, we would be back to our original order, which I don't want to go back to the, have the closing statements in the same order as the opening statements. So we're going to reverse it. And that means that Deputy Secretary Chris Winters goes first. All right, I did get to go first again. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Vermont voters will begin voting in just a couple of days. I hope what you've heard here tonight has opened your eyes a little bit. This is a pretty, uh, pretty attentive crowd. You folks are very engaged people, so maybe you already knew this, but the Secretary of State's office performs some really valuable functions that affect every single one of our lives just about every single day. It's a small but impactful agency with a really broad array of responsibilities. 80 people, a $17 million budget, four divisions, other responsibilities well beyond that were kind of the, uh, the catch-all for when the legislature doesn't know where to put something, they send it to the Secretary of State's office. So this job requires an experienced manager. This job requires someone who has a proven track record. That's the case that I'm trying to make to Vermont voters, that this office really matters, really has an impact. We need an experienced and effective leader in the Secretary of State's office. I believe in safe, secure, and accurate elections. I believe in transparency as the key to rebuilding public trust. I believe in efficient and effective systems to boost the economy. And I believe in defending our democracy through civics, civil discourse, and media literacy. I've been working in this office for 25 years, the last seven as deputy. I'm really proud of the work I've done there. I'm treating this as a job interview. I hope when you look at my resume, see my track record of results, you find that I'm the most qualified person to run the Secretary of State's office next. I've been doing the job. I'm ready to lead on day one. Thank you for being here tonight, and I really appreciate this forum, this opportunity to talk to you all tonight. Thank you. Next, City Clerk John Odom. Well, I think I've, I've made my case for myself, so I don't feel like I need to wrap it up with a bow, so I'll take a question. Um, two biggest challenges that are gonna face the Secretary of State's office. I think, uh, again, it's hard, it's hard not to look at elections. Uh, if I looked at elections, I would say the two biggest challenges there, firstly, would be uh, concerns over public confidence. I think with all that misinformation out there, it really, really shakes up the earth underneath the feet of voters. I think the Secretary of State's office is really the only office that can take point on, on, on you know, helping to solve that problem. And that's going to mean also taking on these questions of fraud head on. And I'll tell you, as a local election administrator, as a city clerk, if there were problems with fraud, we, we would know. Right now, there's, there's a balance between participation and concerns about voter fraud. The balance is way skewed to a need for participation. Should that ever change? Should actual evidence of voter fraud start popping up? Us clerks would be the first persons to jump over on the other side, and it's not happening. So that needs to be really put out there. Finally, I think the cybersecurity issue. I think we need to recognize that we have hit the limits of security offered by the traditional model we're using, which is a, you know, the standard traditional model for uh, protecting networks and everything from schools to businesses or to uh, political parties. When I was the network manager at the, the Vermont Democratic Party, I think we need to realize it's time to flip that around. I think we need to start looking at open source solutions. Talk about ranked source voting. There's some great open source election management systems out there for that. I think we look at that. I think we look at a dedicated network for clerks to run elections so they're not working on the same computers that they're checking their email on. And I think we can uh, really revolutionize and lead the world on this. Thank you. Next, Mr. Brooke Page. OK, very good. Um, I hope that you've learned a little bit more about the functions of the Secretary of State's office and the positions of the candidates, including myself, who are seeking to become the next secretary. While the Democratic candidates have all have similar positions, especially in the area of elections, I believe that I have somewhat con a contrarian view on many of these points. Um, 
Let me stop for just a moment and answer the question uh, that was posed. I believe that one of the greatest problems we have with elections currently is a, a population or a portion of the population that has become in disenchanted or dispirited by the current chaos in the election process. And I talk to many people who say, you know, I just don't vote anymore because I think it's all fixed, I think it's rigged, I think that no matter how I vote, it doesn't really matter. And that's very concerning to me. Uh, our elections fidelity should not be compromised for the sake of speed or convenience. Voting is one of the most important responsibilities citizens exercise, and should, they should be allowed the time necessary to make an informed decision using clear and understandable uh, election processes. To be clear, voting in person on election day is a proud tradition that must be preserved. Early and absentee voting should remain as a way to ensure that citizens who are unavailable on election day can exercise their voting franchise. Election day should be a state holiday to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to vote. The Office of OPR needs to have a thorough review and changes made to make it more effect efficient and effective in pro protecting the public and the regulated professionals. State Archives is in need of attention to restore the records that have been neglected and to make the entire collection more accessible. Additionally, the next Secretary of State, as I've said, needs to restore the educational function that was promoted by the office prior to the Condos administration. I'm Brooke Page, and I hope to become the next Vermont Secretary of State and to work to repair the damage done in recent years and restore the reputation of the Secretary of State's office. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis, you have the final word among the candidates. Thank you, ladies last. All right. Um, so I may look a little sleepy because I just returned home in the wee hours of the morning this morning from a family reunion. My dad is one of five boys, um, raised in the same household by the same loving parents, three of whom are committed Republicans and two of whom are committed Democrats. And it's always been kind of fascinating to me to, uh, to watch them interact with each other. Um, and over the years growing up, uh, when we would get together as a family, uh, I would see them in their heated debates and, their, uh, and, and oftentimes you know, really laying it all out there about why they believe what they believe. These are five people who, uh, who share the same fundamental values and express it differently in how they, uh, how they express their, uh, their partisan affiliation. I think that's really important uh, uh, for us to remember that, uh, that different people come down on different sides of the issue even if they were raised in the same household and, uh, and share the same beliefs and the same values. And that's part of the reason why I think uh, I bring a, an important skill set to the Secretary of State's office of somebody who can recognize where we can find that common ground, where we can agree upon the basic values that we bring to any question at hand. And we can cut through the partisanship and stand firmly in defense of democracy. So I want to take my 18 years of experience and, um, and my track record of uh, bold and innovative leadership, and I'd like to take that to be your next Secretary of State. Thank you. Uh, Sue Racanelli is on her way back up here from League of Women Voters. Today in uh, seven days, the Secretary of State's primary election was identified as one of the three hot elections in the state of Vermont this year. So I know Mr. Page doesn't want to participate in this, but we could do a quick ranked choice vote <laughs> among the Democrats. Maybe not. So uh, this is, back to Sue Racanelli. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank all the candidates for coming here this evening, Kingdom Access Television for streaming this forum, St. John's Ferry Athenaeum for hosting us, our moderator Tom McCone, our volunteers, and you, the viewers, for your interest in this election.
The League and its co-sponsors will also be hosting a candidates forum for U.S. House of Representatives on Thursday, June the 30th. Remember to vote on or before August the 9th, and have a good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.